all of uh, our social media family. Um, great to have you aboard with us. We are um, going to be in the Gospel of John, continuing our um, journey through that particular Gospel. We're in Chapter 5 from where we left off last week. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, open our Bibles there and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, um, we come close. Um, we sit here at your feet waiting to hear from you. Uh, your sermons are always um, so inspiring and so important. Uh, so, Lord, we just wait to hear the things that you have to share. And I pray, Father, that we'd get it, that it would um, just, just, just saturate us. And, Lord, uh, as we believe it, it would inspire faith and it, it, would, it would create such an inspiration for us to share the things that we learn and the things that we experience here with others. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. And amen. Well, guys, you know, sometimes sermons or teachings are educational. And sometimes sermons and teachings are informational. Sometimes they're inspirational. Well, guys, the teaching that Jesus is giving today that we'll read in John chapter 5 is all of those. It is educational, it's informational, it's inspirational. So are you ready? Well, look at your neighbor, look him in the eye and say, fasten your seatbelt. Look at him and say, fasten your seatbelt. Now listen, here's what took place. After an undebatable miracle where Jesus healed a man who was paralyzed for 38 years. I mean, he had 38 years, he had been in that condition had gone none the better, but only getting worse, body continuing to deteriorate, and Jesus came to the place where he was. He told him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And the man shifted down there on the floor, and when he did, the Spirit of God, the life of God, came into his body and gave his feet and his legs and his ankles and everything, strength and life, and he walked up, he jumped up, I'm assuming. He jumped up and he praised the Lord. And that's a good place to praise the Lord, right? So after that undebatable miracle in healing that man, the religious leaders argued with Jesus for doing the miracle on the Sabbath. Everybody said out loud on the what? On the Sabbath. Now, Sabbath was God's um, commandment of rest from mundane work to focus on God, to focus on His Word, and to focus on His will. That's the reason God gave that commandment, so that we wouldn't lose sight of who's most important. Can you say amen? So, so God had given that commandment, but the religious leaders had redefined work. When God said, I don't want you, I want you to take a day of rest from mundane work, it was just your routine, but the religious leaders redefined work. And according to them, healing or curing was work because it was considered nursing. And so they were in a huff because Jesus healed on the, what day was it? Everybody said out loud, Sabbath. So Jesus explained to them his reason for working on the Sabbath. Jesus said, God took one day off after creation. But since the day man sinned in the garden, God hasn't taken a day off. God has been working nonstop since then to provide a way of salvation or a redemption or a rescue for mankind. Jesus said it this way, My Father God works, so I work. In fact, let's go ahead and read the actual uh, record. And here's where it says, John chapter 5, verse 16. He said, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath. And they sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them. Let's read this out loud. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And everybody go, because oh, that's what was sounding uh, uh, that day Jesus said it. All right, listen. In a few short sentences there, Jesus claimed to be God's son. 
I mean, Jesus said, my father God is in, in the search and rescue business 24-7, 365 days a year. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. My father doesn't take any days off, no vacations, no Sabbath, and neither do I. He said, I am following his lead. I'm doing his will. He said, my father has given me the power to give spiritual life to those who believe. And eventually to judge those who don't. Let's read the next line. And here's what he says. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has given life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is, everybody say it out loud, he is the Son of Man. So, First of all, Jesus calls God his father, says we're in the search and rescue business. And that's the reason uh, that, that, that I don't, that I'm working on the Sabbath, that I don't take a day off because God did it. And so I'm busy doing his work. And then in these few short sentences that we just read, Jesus claimed to be God's son and this. Everybody said out loud the what? The son of man. So first, Jesus, I'm the son of God. And then he claims to be the son of man. Now, the son of man was an Old Testament term that the prophet Daniel used to describe the future Messiah. All right. In fact, Daniel said that the son of man kept using that term, son of man, talking about the Messiah. Jesus used that term for himself. In fact, Jesus used that title, son of man, to describe himself at least 70 times that are recorded. Jesus was saying, I am the Son of God. I am the Savior of the world. Well, guys, the religious leaders, when they heard that, were livid. They started fussing louder than a pressure cooker at full steam, right? Everybody, shh. Oh. See, it was considered blasphemy, say that word out loud, what? Blasphemy, which means it was considered a horrendous sin to claim that you were in any way equal to God. Jews could claim to be a child of Abraham, but not a child of God. All right, the religious leaders were ready to pull Jesus outside and stone him to death for his claim. Because first, he says, he's the son, God is his father. And then he claims that he is the son of man, the Messiah. And so they're like, they're ready to rip their clothes. They're ready to, they're ready to shout blasphemy and take him out of the, you know, outside and stone him. So Jesus is going to need a strong defense to keep him from being executed. Now listen, if you are on trial... What are the keys to a successful defense? Let me ask, if you were on trial, what are the keys to a successful defense? What will you need to exonerate yourself? Can I get a few answers? Witnesses. Witnesses. What else? Evidence. What else? A good lawyer. But Jesus is uh, the advocate. Amen? All right. So here's what you need. You need good witnesses. You need good evidence, you need facts, and you need a good character, right? If you're going to exonerate yourself. Well, Jesus, like a savvy defense attorney, leverages those things in front of the religious leaders. He is ready to lay out a defense. Because Jesus wants the whole world to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is the son of God and the savior of the world. So he's ready to lay out the facts. Everybody say it. Lay it on us, Jesus. Go ahead and say it. Lay it on us, Jesus. I didn't hear you. All right. I'm not Jesus, but Jesus is speaking here. Chapter 5, verse 31. Here's what he says. Jesus said, If I bear witness of myself, 
my witness is not true. All right, so a good defense is going to need witnesses, evidence. It's going to need facts and character. And Jesus brings this out like a savvy de defense attorney. And Jesus first pointed to his character and personal testimony. He said, I told you that I'm imitating my father. And I have told you who I am. That I'm the son of God, the savior of the world. But Jesus says, but I know that if it's just me talking about myself, it's not true. It's not enough. Everybody said it's not enough. It's not enough. Because you could say a lot of things about yourself that we don't know if they're true or not, right? <laughs> like your Facebook page. No, no, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just joking. Here we go. But he says, I've, I've said all those things, but I know that just, just me saying those things, it's not enough. That would be like the self-checkout. You do the store's work for them, but they still don't trust you. They treat you with doubt and suspicion, and they want to see your receipt. You know what I'm saying? That's what the religious leaders were doing. Jesus had said, he is the son of God. He is the Messiah. They said, well, let us see the receipt. Jesus says, I know that you guys, if I say it, you don't believe me. He says, so, so here's what he's going to do. And Jesus knew that. And, and, and Jesus knew that you need two or three witnesses. In fact, Jesus knew that throughout Scripture, it states that it takes two or three witnesses for any claim to be established. And because of that, Jesus presented another witness to prove that he is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Watch what he says. He says, you guys want proof, but I, I, I've told you who I am. I've, uh, my character displays it, but uh, you, you need the mouth. it's got to come out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. So, there's another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, John the Baptist, and he has borne witness to the truth, yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. So, Speaking of myself isn't enough because you need two or three witnesses according to the scripture, Jesus said. So I'm going to tell you who's, who else uh, uh, is, can testify of me. Jesus reminded them of, everybody said out loud, John the Baptist. All right? He says, all of you respected John the Baptist as a prophet from God that spoke the truth. You considered him a burning and shining man of God. And, he, and John had some insightful things to say about me, Jesus said. In fact, here are some of the things that John the Baptist said. John said, John the Baptist said, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. That's actually talking about the Messiah. That those are actions of the Messiah. So he's saying he's going, the Messiah is going. Then he will clean, clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into its barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. So John the Baptist said that about Jesus. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. Wow. So Jesus told the religious leaders, a prophet that you believed in called me transcendent, called me all powerful, called me the eternal son of God and savior of the world. But let me give you another witness, Jesus said. Let's read verse 36. But I have a greater witness than John's for the work which the father has given me to finish they very, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. All right, so here Jesus says, hey, listen, I have made some claims. 
You guys want to know how, you know, you just can't take my word for it? So let me tell you who else is witnessing for me. John the Baptist. But there's also another witness that testifies of me. Works. The works that I do. Listen, God leaked information throughout the Old Testament about the Messiah, Savior, that would, he would eventually send. God revealed that his Messiah would cure the incurable, do the impossible, accomplish the unbelievable. God said that about the Messiah in the Old Testament, that he would open blind eyes, unstop deaf ears, that the lame shall leap like a deer, kind of like the guy Jesus just healed at the pool. At the pool. He said, the tongue of the blind, God spoke, said, the tongue of the dumb will sing and the dead will be raised to life. Those were the prophecies and predictions that God said that the Messiah would do. Well, Jesus had performed all of those miracles publicly. In fact, one of their own, one of their own influential religious leaders is on record, of the religious leaders, one of them, was on record commenting about Jesus' miracles. John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, read this out loud with me. We all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Guys, the works that Jesus did testified that he was the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So far, it's a, who, who has testified? John the Baptist, the works that Jesus did. But Jesus said there's still another, even more authoritative witness that is going to test, uh, can test a test uh, of me. Let's read verse 37. Here's what it says. And the, uh, everybody... Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. All right, so so far there's this first testimony. The, the first person testifying on Jesus' behalf was, guys, you remember? John the Baptist. Then there's a second one that are his works. And now he says, the Father himself. Listen, God's word is infallible, inerrant, and eternal. And the Bible says that God exalts his word even above his name. And as one scripture says, it is impossible for God to lie. Let's say that out loud. It is impossible for God to lie. And God gave a public endorsement of Jesus three times. God gave a public endorsement of Jesus three times. Once at Jesus' baptism, when he came up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, God spoke from heaven and said, read it out loud, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God said that in a public setting. Then on the mountain of transfiguration, God introduced Jesus to Moses and Elijah who appeared there in front of the disciples. And guess what God said again? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Then, during the last week of Jesus' ministry, Jesus shot out a prayer to his heavenly Father. And let's read what happened in John chapter 12 and verse 27. He said, Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. 
Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit and not mine. Jesus explained that the audible voice of God was so that people would know and believe that the almighty God had endorsed Jesus Christ. Because that's what took place there. Yet the religious leaders had chosen to cover their ears and to reject the son that God had sent. They're, they're kind of like that woman who got pulled over by the police for speeding in a school zone. As the officer was writing her a ticket, she said, How come I always get a ticket and everybody else I know gets a warning? Is it my face? She asked the officer. No, ma'am, said the officer. It's your foot. <laughs> Jesus was telling the religious leaders the same thing. It's not your head. It's your heart. You guys need to move to Egypt because you know what? You're in denial, if you know what I mean. Now, Jesus could have stopped with three witnesses because that's all out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. He could have stopped there, but Jesus went on to a fourth witness, guys, just for good measure. Here's what he says in verse 39. He said, you religious leaders search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. So, so far the testimonies or the witnesses that are speaking on Jesus' behalf that have spoke loudly. He said, number one was John the Baptist. Number two were the works that he did. Number three was... God the Father. And now he's saying, the scripture. Everybody said out loud, the what? The scripture. Jesus pointed the religious leaders to the scriptures. And Jesus kind of made fun of them. He said, you search and you search the scriptures, but you haven't discovered me in them. I mean, you guys got to be blind, dumb, or just plain dishonest at this point. Why would he say that? Because Jesus is in every book of the Old Testament that they, used, that they were reading. Jesus was Noah's ark in Genesis. He was the ram in Abraham's altar. He was the ladder in Jacob's dream. Jesus was the Passover lamb in Exodus, the tabernacle in the book of Leviticus. Jesus is the serpent on the pole in Numbers. He's the captain of the Lord's host in Joshua. He's the angel of the Lord in Judges. He's the eternal king in the book of Kings. He is the discovered scroll in Ezra. He's the fourth man in the fiery furnace in Daniel. Jesus is all over the Old Testament. But the religious leaders missed it. It's like that couple who went to the Bahamas. And when they got to their 18th story Oceanside Suite in the Windham Hotel. I've been there. It's beautiful. But this couple, they were so obsessed with a balcony window. Its thickness, the density of the glass, the dimensions, the framing around it. They never saw the beautiful blue waters of the Atlantic. Guys, the Bible is a window to look through and see Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself said, the volume of the book is about me. That's what Jesus said. He's on every page. If you're reading the Bible and you aren't seeing Jesus, learning about Jesus, or knowing Jesus, you got too many cobwebs in the attic, man. Look at your neighbor and say, I hope he's not talking about you. Just tell him, I hope he's not talking about you. Now listen. We here today, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you and me. Just look at him and tell him, you and me. We here today have the same five witnesses that Jesus presented to the religious leaders then. And we have more. Everybody said, what? And more. They had five witnesses that Jesus presented to them that he is the Son of God and Savior of the world. 
You and I on this side of the Old Testament, in the New Testament, have those same five witnesses and more. Everybody say it out loud. What? And more. We have some witnesses unique to us. Some undeniable, uncontestable witnesses. Would you like to know what they are? Here we go. Number one. The Holy Spirit. Say it out loud. The what? The Holy... They didn't have that in the, back then. The Holy Spirit didn't come into full-time ministry until after Jesus resurrected from the dead. He was on certain and specific and limited people in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the whole Holy Spirit came into His full-time ministry after Jesus resurrected. And before then, men didn't have the in-working spirit that we do to convince us of Jesus. Sometimes we think, those guys were so dense. Those, those, those Hebrews, those Jews were just stacked up. I mean, they're so dense. They didn't have what you and I have, the Holy Spirit helping to convince them that Jesus is the Savior. You and I have that. The Holy Spirit came later, and Jesus described the Holy Spirit's ministry like this. He will convince you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. In other words, the Holy Spirit presses us, before we're saved, from the outside. The Holy Ghost haunts us with guilt, regret, shame, and fear of judgment. The Holy Spirit does that. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit pressures us to draw close to God. He's the one in telling us, you got to stop this selfishness. You got to stop this sinful living. You got to start going to church. You got to give your life, give your life over to Jesus. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit within. And the Holy Spirit won't stop pressing us until we finally surrendered to his prompting or we die. So if you're tired of the rumble strips, maybe you ought to get on the road with Jesus. So there's the Holy Spirit. We've, we've got all those same five, but we also have the Holy Spirit that is a witness, that is constantly from the outward pressing in when we're unbelievers. Pressing in to convince us of who Jesus is. And push us in his direction. You and I would have never come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We would have never gone on the right highway if the Holy Spirit hadn't been pushing us, prompting us, guiding us, pushing us there. You know, I always tell you, when people say, oh, I found the Lord. No, you didn't. You were so lost. You couldn't find your... You did. The Holy Spirit is the one who was pressuring you. The Holy Spirit pressures and pushes us. We have that. That is undeniable. We also, another viable witness to our generation is changed lives. Say it out loud. What? Changed lives. Now, the religious leaders back then had hundreds of lives who had been changed, had been healed and delivered by Jesus. They had all of those around them that they could see. We have hundreds of people of changed lives around us that we can see. In fact, look around you right now. Yeah, go ahead. I know that sometimes at church you just want to say, no, turn around, look at people all around you, all right? Look at them. All of these changed lives testify that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Because if you knew most of these people, they wouldn't be in church on Sunday morning. But the Savior stepped into their lives and found them and saved And that's a good place to cheer and shout. Yeah. You can look around and see all the changed lives. Jesus is the only one that can turn sinners to saints. He's the only one that can turn jerks to gems. He's the only one that can turn grumps to gleeful. He is the only one that can turn the hateful to hospitable. 
The only one who can turn the angry into the amicable. If the person you're sitting next to isn't quite there yet, they will be. Everybody say, they will be. And let me tell you why. Because it's been promised. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, And I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue His work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. <laughs> Woo! Right? For some of us, a cheer. Yeah! Right? I'm a long way from where I need to be, but praise God, He's working on us. Look at, my, look at your neighbor and say, I'm under construction right now. Just look at them and tell them, I'm under construction right now. So listen. Our world has more witnesses and evidence that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world than what Jesus revealed to the religious leaders back then. You and I have even a greater evidence and witness. So hopefully, we in our generation will accept and believe. Because here's the last verse for the morning. It is Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. Let's read it out loud together. Can we escape eternal judgment if we neglect the latest message of magnificent salvation? First of all, it was delivered in person by the master, then accurately passed to us by those who heard it from him. All the while, God was validating it with gifts through the Holy Spirit, all sorts of signs and miracles as he saw fit. With all of that evidence that is laid out before us, can we justifiably, can we consciously say, I don't know if he's the only way. I don't know if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Huh. With all of that evidence, if we deny it, can we escape eternal judgment? <sighs> no way. So the idea is, Jesus, he made some claims, but he backed it up with all the evidence that was necessary for us. So if you're ever doubting, is Jesus really real? Is he really the Savior? Is he really coming back for us? One way to really shut that up is look around here at church and see the changed lives. Think about the Holy Spirit on the inside of you that doesn't let you sin. Right? I mean, you can do it, but you don't feel good after it. You feel all condemned, right? You come to church and like, ah. <laughs> Huh? Am I right? Let it be a reminder. Jesus is who he claimed to be. All the evidences are there. It's, and it will be an utter confidence for you. And Because when you know Jesus that intimately, it is a beautiful experience. Did you learn something this morning? Aren't you glad that Jesus gave that teaching and kind of just clarified everything so beautifully? You know, often I get complimented on, on the messages that I bring I can't take any credit. I just preached Jesus' sermon. That's all I did. It's his words that have life and that bring life change. So grab a hold of them and ride them all the way into eternity. But listen, if you're here this morning or if you're watching and you haven't surrendered your life to the Lord, there is no reason why you shouldn't surrender to him as your king as the Savior. So I'm going to invite you to do that. Let's all stand together and we'll pray out loud together. Father, I know I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I've ignored you. I've run from you and I have fought you. But today, today I surrender. I repent for my sin and I turn to you. I believe the witnesses 
The words that came from you? The words that came from the Father? The works that you did? I believe in the Holy Spirit that's touching my heart. And I surrender to you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe to, this morning you're rededicating your life, we have some materials we'd love to give you, some Bibles and some uh, materials. So at the close of this next song, just come on up. There'll be some leaders standing here. They would love to pray with you and meet you. So take advantage of that. And, um, and listen, the rest of, they're also here for those of you that have prayer needs or you're just going through some difficulties this season and you need someone to pray with, they will be happy to do that. And listen, before you take off and leave the, the building, there's always some wonderful, um, you know, refreshments out front. Enjoy some coffee, some fellowship, um, and then you can just go deal with the madhouse if you're not finished uh, you're with your Christmas shopping. Uh, grab some peace uh, along with a piece of cake on the way out, right? Um, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to smile on you this week and be gracious to you and give you peace. May the beauty of the Lord be upon you, and may he establish all the works of your hands. Have a wonderful rest of your week, guys. We'll see you next Sunday.